Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of Bronze Age Pervert. In the second of three lectures over his well-known book, Bronze Age Mindset, we will move on to part two, Parable of the Iron Prison. Now, this video is, of course, available for patrons only, so I'd like to begin by thanking everybody who has joined the School of Forbidden Texts, especially welcoming the new members and reminding you that if you have any suggestions for how to make the school more interactive, any requests for any sort of topic or book or thinker you'd like to see discussed, and of course, the invitation is open for you to do a guest lecture over a topic of your choice. All of this I encourage you to discuss either here on YouTube, on Discord, on Patreon, any one of those formats, and once again, thank you so much for being a part of the school. So if we move on to the 31st section of the text, we might be reminded of how Nietzsche contrasted nihilism and the affirmative will to power, and that because being qua being is will to power, not willing at all really is not an option. Not all will, however, is created equal, and the um, difference between the two types really comes down to whether the will is strong enough to say yes to this life and this world, despite its admitted imperfection ugliness and suffering, and not only to say yes to it this one time and then it will be over, but to say yes to it an infinite number of times. If you lose the moment of creation as posited by traditional religion, and you lose the moment of judgment as posited by traditional religion, you'll be left with the uniquely discomforting prospect that time will become infinite but matter will remain finite, in which case the same events will inevitably repeat themselves, not just once, but an infinite number of times in the eternal return. And it bears mentioning that whether this is empirically true or not, it still does provide a very valuable psychological test to see whether the will is strong enough to say yes even to the very worst things happening an infinite number of times. Needless to say, most will will fail this test, but rather Rather than um, not will at all, they will instead literally will nothing. They will denigrate this life as so bad only because the real life, the real world, the real thing is somewhere else. They will fall into the dualism of contrasting what you see here with uh, the senses with um, the platonic realm of ideas or the thing in itself of Kant or heaven and hell within traditional religion. But in either case, they're simply willing nihilistically rather than not will at all. Similarly, Bronze Age pervert contrasts life under distress with life in ascent and freedom to use his own terms. There is nothing wrong, of course, with examining the former, so long as you do not make the error of confusing it with the latter. This is not purely hypothetical, by the way, as one can see that the process of domesticating nature largely consists of, for example, taking animals' hardwired drive to seek out space to develop their own abilities, as we discussed in the last lecture, and then establish uh, certain technological barriers, which slowly reveal the utter impossibility of ever doing so, basically making the power process impossible to go through no matter how much effort you might expend towards a goal which has um, been put artificially out of reach for you. This pseudo-environment which the animal will be trapped in will be defined by a certain institutionalized learned helplessness which will eventually yield a being who is more like a puppet or a doll, something which might play through the actions of becoming itself, but something which could never really do so. How long, though, since we too have been domesticated in just this way? asks Bronze Age Pervert. Much like Julius Evola, therefore, Bronze Age Pervert notes that the very term modern world is actually something of a misnomer. All the things that make modernity suck are, in fact, nothing new at all. These were the same techniques of oppression which were already known long ago, but have simply been re-released under a superficially different marketing label. It's quite literally the case that we are living through a cheesy-ass remake of the same techniques of control that were already formally institutionalized at least as far back as the ancient world itself. Above all, the progress which modernity is teleologically oriented towards actualizing is simply a regression back to the yeast mode of life itself. It's interesting that the most sophisticated technologies in world history simply serve the purpose to take us back to the most primitive form of life that there is. Interestingly, the tool that the system uses to get us to accept this madness is precisely reason itself, but reason defined, as we saw in the last section, as a certain epistemological technology which does not ever make great discoveries that are accessible only through a certain intuitive grasp of them, but rather takes 
discoveries already made by others and then maximizes the transmissibility and comprehensibility of those ideas, eventually to the point that the uh, herd of mediocre nihilists becomes overtly hostile towards the very notion of greatness or an exceptional mind, precisely for becoming too rationalized. Likewise, isn't the crisis of masculinity so obviously a problem in our era simply derivative of the general impossibility of there being such a thing as really dominating a space and developing one's power as ascending life within it? At best, we only ever get a caricature, which of course only exists as a spectacle to impress others on the most superficial of grounds, but the real thing is basically ruled out in advance through a very strange sense in which any space where the spectacle occurs is always already owned in advance by the system itself, or in Ellulian terms, the artificial systematization of technique has to already determine in advance which place the things will occupy even before the things themselves arrive there. So any real conquest of space is strictly impossible for so insignificant an individual as you. Yet isn't the man who reacts to this crisis by misidentifying the institutional and systemic forces of intersectional oppression which the system told him lie at the root and then join the chorus to denounce toxic masculinity, just the one who really falls for the system's neatest trick by advancing the same thing which oppressed him in the first place, only helping to make this space even more owned in advance than it already was? Likewise, Bronze Age Perfect notes that there's actually something of an equivocation in saying that civilization has been a constant presence in the Far East for thousands of years, whereas it's a fairly recent invention in the West. If one forgets that much of the writing in ancient China was simply long lists of names for strictly governmental purposes, with absolutely no aesthetic or philosophical value in the vast majority of such cases. Also, it was precisely the squalor, misery, and filth of the eastern cities of old that made the Buddha unnaturally question life itself, something which never could have happened for a nomad who actually got to live the natural way of dominating open spaces in a free manner. We mistake the great accomplishments of Western civilization, such as the ancient Greek city-state, uh, Greek philosophy, the Greek epic, etc., for universal features of all civilization civilization whatsoever, forgetting that it was actually the historical norm for civilization to be a regression of life to its yeast form rather than a means of allowing it to reach the ascending form. Likewise, Bronze Age Pervert noted that it is inherently self-contradictory to claim that environmentalism is a leftist concern when the SJW only ever uses manufactured concern for the destruction of nature as one more excuse to show you why the West really is uniquely evil and responsible for something which is going on in its worst form in China. In my own terms, the SJW could never bring itself, and uh, by the way, we really do need to get beyond the outdated gender pronouns of a century ago, to the deep ecology stance, because that would require a certain active nihilism, which would dissolve all of its sacred politically correct linguistifications as only so many baseless illusions, which really would collapse under a true revaluation of values, which would uh, reveal ideological staples like the uh, unique and irreplaceable human individual who must be saved at all costs, as well as seeking out green technology solutions to the same problems caused by technology in the first place, as so many politically correct fictions which were actually founded on the pathological mind of man rather than the purified mind of nature. The greatest perversion of all, of course, was hijacking ecology itself and turning it into just one more linguistification, which only served to make precisely its own referent of ecological reality impossible to access phenomenologically. In other words, SGWs miss the point that gender fluidity, post-racialism, open borders, sexual consumerism, and the pseudo-accelerationist rioting against defenseless mom-and-pop businesses on Main Street, but not against the wealthiest corporations which are actually screwing the world over, these are not the revaluation of values which would succeed in undermining the West's foundational ideals, but are themselves precisely the modern-day equivalent of Nietzsche's own unquestionable values of Protestant Christian piety. Their dissolution under the force of life is 
quite fitting, for it is only their destruction that provides the condition for life to prevail in the Lincoln sense. You can only preserve ecology if you do away with environmentalism. Even if one accepts that modernity is a failure, is it wrong to idealize peasants when they are basically themselves humans turned to livestock? You might notice, for example, that they always keep their faces pre uh, pretty close to the ground, kind of like grazing cattle. Isn't this a perversion of domestication which negates the anarcho-primitivist drive towards the freedom of life? It was for this reason that Dmitry Orlov himself noted that the old Russian joke about peasants turning into hunchbacks after too many years spent laboring in basically the same position is something which people basically won't understand today because we don't really have those kinds of peasants in the West as they've been replaced by tractors and a pesticide spraying airplanes and other machines. How, though, could the philosophical contemplation of the universe, man, your greatest accomplishments of the intellect, emerge from somebody who had to be enslaved in just this way. Far from being the noble savage who offers an escape from the technological worldview we are trapped in, this really is the frame or worldview that turns all matter and all things into mere utilities, as he says himself, despite the fact that it does not need technology in the literal sense of, say, physical machinery to do so, and never has by the way, in fact, the old village witch hunts, in the literal sense of the term, were largely just the coordinated destruction of anyone intelligent enough to question the herd and its values. Ironically, it's precisely the SJW suburbanites who are the modern village idiots in this sense of the term. Interestingly, especially from a Kaczynski and slash Ilulian perspective, a Bronze Age pervert claims that the problem is actually not with the technology as such, but rather with its perverse ability to generate a surplus in the population of the rabble, which in turn gives them far too much power over the great and the exceptional. In other words, in a Lincoln sense, the only issue really is overpopulation rather than technology as such. In an almost accelerationist sense, however, he warns traditionalists that if they attempt to simply drop out and start a rustic village which recreates some uh, stereotypical nostalgic image of life in the past, this won't actually overcome the problems of the modern world, but will instead freeze them in their current obviously unsatisfactory state. Does this mean, though, that we can only overcome this evil through intentionally accelerating it to the point of an explosion? Here we have a very strange coincidence of seeming opposites. On the one hand, we have accelerationism in contrast with some nostalgic, uh, paleoconservative worldview, and we also have deep ecology in co contrast with the leftist, pseudo-environmentalist, pseudo-worldview. We can only restore nature's true nature, in other words, as the will to power of ascending life if we do not fall for the trick of halting the current level of domestication into something which will inevitably solidify or restore other forms of equally problematic domestication from the pre-modern past, we have to just keep going. Likewise, Bronze Age pervert actively rejects the comforting myth that the system is just a non-human mechanism which brought about the modern world through no fault of any one person, but rather as a result of its own impersonal, materialistic circumstances. In reality, Bronze Age pervert notes, I think all of this was consciously crafted, even if we'll never know who the people are. I mean, they probably just seem like ordinary folks to the naked eye. This retreat into treating material conditions as something which can passively determine even the wealthiest and most powerful figures on the earth, isn't this just the ultimate form of nihilism? This is a denial of life itself as just another ideological illusion, which, of course, will be deconstructed by the Marxist hermeneutic of material conditions. Paradoxically, though, the liberation of the senses only ended up negating them. The medieval peasant, for example, had not only more lust for life, but more sexual lust too, even under the extreme moralistic constraints of medieval Catholicism, than a modern low-energy, low-testosterone man living under the tyranny of the sex-positivist ideology and the technology of adult entertainment. Somehow, the thing in itself was destroyed precisely by forcing it into existence too much. Paradoxically, the real world, therefore, is not the one you ordinarily see, yet it also is not beyond it in some platonic, eternal, or dualistic sense. 
Brown's Age Brewery notes that when Heraclitus speaks of all things being one and all things being fire, he means this. When this actually shows itself to you, there is a demonic and violent madness underlying things. The real world is similar to the apparent but uncanny, devilish, and disordered for us. By the way, remember the weird cults who claim that you are a spark of divinity which has been trapped in matter. Therefore, the law of the Bible itself is the law of matter. Therefore, you can only become divine by intentionally breaking the moral law for its own sake. Isn't SJW just this only in a secularized modern form? The irony is that their pseudo-iconoclastic rebellion against the law is itself simply the worst form of materialism, since it misses the point that nature is not so much dead matter which we are trapped in, but rather the kind of life which they only get further and further away from the more they try to artificially force through the act against it. Once again, it is precisely reason which leads you to conclude that on logical and quantitative grounds alone, there is far more suffering than joy in this existence, therefore the world of matter is indeed a huge mistake. Isn't Nietzsche's affirmative will to power, as we discussed at the beginning of this lecture, the one which affirms against reason and by means of the same kind of absurdity which Kierkegaard also saw as the condition for the religious leap of faith? The problem, though, is not the suffering itself so much as the feeling that as a domestication progresses in all spaces always already owned rather than free, one really cannot escape. There's no place left which really lies beyond. We are not far from the point where the cult of evil matter mentioned at the beginning is universalized into the default state of all. Bronze Age pervert challenges once again a nostalgic retreat into the pre-modern past by asking how much of the noble savage stereotype was actually based on tribal peoples telling Western anthropologists blatantly ridiculous lies in order to make them look silly when they unquestioningly reported them in their studies. Anyone who repeats this as proof that utopia really does exist on some remote Pacific island far beyond the Wicked West is akin to the Mark Zuckerberg of the 2010 film. That is to say, somebody who misses the point precisely by interpreting the surface-level meaning of the message far too literally. While this made Zuckerberg the ultimate social idiot, anyone who promotes the noble savage myth after this had been revealed, is indeed the ultimate anthropological idiot. The same goes, by the way, for the kind of pseudo-historical accounts that the oldest feminist golden age were uh, populated by matriarchal societies which were only later deformed into the patriarchal ones in a fall from grace directly stolen from the same Garden of Eden archetype which these people will ordinarily mock. Interestingly, though, Bronze Age pervert claims that Guénon Evola and Jung really are part of the same problem. Traditionalism is the fantasy of something like a Western version of the noble savage from a golden age past without realizing that what is holding back life today is precisely this human all too human element which must be overcome rather than preserved, once again getting back to the accelerationist idea. In fact, it is not a coincidence that cannibalism is both a trait of yeast life and of an actual return to the lowest forms of human life.